Some people say the battery is the most important part of an electric vehicle. It's also the most expensive single component, 20 to 30% of the vehicle net cost. Which battery are we using for our Jeep conversion? This is Electrified Veronica with another episode of our Jeep conversion, episode 5. Let's have a look at our project so far. We found an old car, happens to be a Jeep Wrangler. We removed the engine, defined the powertrain configuration, ordered e-motors and inverters, and now we arrived at the heart of the EV conversion, the battery. Which ones do we choose? How many and how do we keep them safe and healthy? The big question of course is what's the electric range? of the Jeep. So how many miles can I go on one charge? When picking a battery for a conversion project, you have several restrictions. First one is weight. Once the conversion is done, you don't want to exceed the original overall vehicle weight too much. We did a detailed weight analysis in one of the last videos. Overall, we took out 400 kilogram, which is 880 pounds. 200 kilogram of that was for the engine. Now, once you put stuff back inside, it leaves us with 250 kilogram of batteries. This is 560 pounds. The second restriction is of course space. So where can you find space for all the batteries that you need? The third one is the voltage level. And of course, this has to be aligned with the e-motor inverter system that you pick. And the last one is of course, cost and availability. Maybe you want to look into new batteries or maybe you have access to some scrapped cars where you can reuse these batteries. There are different options out there. So let's talk about batteries. As you can see here, I have a variety of different cells, modules, and even one pack here. This is for a fuel cell electric vehicle, by the way. So I'm pretty sure that you all know that batteries in electric vehicles consist of individual battery cells. So these are the smallest units of power and energy. These are then assembled into what we call modules, like this one here for a prismatic cell or this one here for cylindrical cells. And then several of these modules make a pack in your electric car. Traditionally, many automakers try to use their existing platforms, so the ones for ICE cars, and try to use the space for batteries. Today, what we see a lot is so-called skateboards. So really having one huge pack along the floor of electric vehicle. There's also trends called cell to pack or cell to chassis. So for cell to pack, companies are skipping the modules and are integrating cells directly into the packs in order to save space. Then Tesla, for example, in their latest electric cars, they are using these 4680 cells and they are integrating these directly into the chassis. This is a 3D printed battery, by the way, but it has the same dimension. As you can imagine, for a conversion that we're doing here, you cannot really use these huge packs or the skateboard. So we really need to find smaller entities, modules. In best case, they are even reconfigurable and kind of flexible in their dimensions. So we can use them in different locations of the car. So let's see where we can find some space in our Jeep for the batteries after removing the engine, transmission, gas tank, and so on. So first of all, we have some space on both sides of the drive shaft going to the rear axle. Then of course, we have plenty of space in the engine compartment. And after all, there is also a little bit of space where the original gas tank used to be. What you see here is probably not the final solution, but it shows you options where you could put the batteries. Of course, you have to consider things like the battery box around the modules, the cooling system, but also very important, the overall weight distribution. This is why we will actually include a real Jeep expert that we found just around the corner here in Franklin, Wisconsin, to help us with the suspension and mounting of the mechanical drivetrain and batteries. Once you did your first little space claim analysis, we can start talking about chemistry. The first conversion that people did was using lead acid batteries. This is the chemistry, very old chemistry, that you can find in your starter batteries. Like this, for example, is the starter battery of our Jeep. These conversions worked, but you can imagine that the range of these cars was very low because 
these batteries are super heavy. The state-of-the-art chemistry in today's electric vehicles is lithium-ion batteries. There is a whole slew of battery chemistries out there and everybody that has watched this video knows exactly about the nomenclature. For our conversion, we will be using NMC nickel manganese cobalt chemistry. It has a high energy density. There is a concern about the raw materials used in there, especially about the cobalt. And this is also why the whole battery industry is moving towards LFP and also other chemistries in the future. By the way, they're also transitioning the starter batteries in combustion engine vehicles to lithium ion battery chemistries in order to save weight. While there are many different chemistries out there, there are only three major cell formants. Probably the most famous cell formant is cylindrical cells. These are used by Tesla, but also Lucid Motors or Rivian. Then there are prismatic ones with a metal case. This is the plus and the minus one. These are, for example, used by BMW. And then there are so-called pouch cells. They just have a thin foil around them. They're pretty flexible. This is the plus and the minus pole. They come in different formats and they're used by Hyundai, GM, or for example, Ford. We see a lot of do-it-yourself projects and also companies that offer conversion kits based on cylindrical cells. For example, you can easily find used Tesla modules on eBay. Cylindrical cells also have a certain safety advantage. In case of a so-called thermal runaway on cell level, there is less of a chance for the fire to really propagate throughout the whole pack. If you want to understand how likely a battery fire in an electric vehicle is, you have to watch this video. The cells that we're using are pouch cells because we got several modules from a scrapped car. So these modules are not new, which goes very well with our project values. You know, we wanted to reuse as much as we can, but it has a disadvantage. I don't know what happened to them before. The only thing I know is that these are LG cells. So in a future video, I want to show you which test system we set up to characterize the cells. By the way, everybody of you has something like that in the kitchen. Next thing to talk about is the voltage level. So each individual cell here has a voltage of around three to four volts. We call that the open circuit voltage. And depending on how you connect them, you know, the electrical connections, how many are in series, how many are in parallel, you get a certain overall voltage. We have seen quite a few conversions that work at a lower voltage level, but we have chosen to go with 400 volts. The reason why we're going with higher voltage is a very simple equation equation. Power is voltage times current. The higher the voltage, the lower the current. If we use Ohm's law, this turns into I squared R. So the lower we can get the current, the less losses we have. So the first thing we did with these modules is put them on a scale. They are pretty heavy. They weigh 39 kilogram, which is 86 pounds. Remember that we had 250 kilogram for the batteries in total. So we could put seven of these stock modules into our Jeep. Now the next thing we did is measure the voltage with a simple voltmeter and they turn out to be around 30 volts per module. So let's look into the configuration of these modules. As you can see, they consist of 16 of these slices hold together by two end plates. Now one of these slices consists of two LG pouch cells connected in parallel. In the middle, there is a thin heat transfer plate that sticks out at the bottom. So this whole bottom part is glued to a cooling plate. Once you remove these side covers, which says 4P8S, you can see the electrical connections of these slices. Now, 4P8S or 8S4P means 8 times 3.6 volts, which is 28.8 volts. Now, everybody that did their calculations in their head can realize that with these stock modules at 28.8 volts and seven of these, we can't reach the 400 volts that we need for our powertrain configuration. This is the reason we're building our own custom modules. We started to disassemble these modules into slices and we will start reassembling them into our customized battery modules. In order to get to the voltage level, we will reconfigure these modules using two cells in parallel instead of four. And this is how we will double the voltage. Stay tuned for the final configuration. This will be a surprise. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is the battery management system, BMS, and the cooling system. If you build your own battery for your EV conversion, you also have to have a battery management system. So something that measures current, voltage, and temperatures of your cells and basically uses algorithms to keep your battery safe and healthy. 
After researching several BMS options, we decided to go with AEM and their battery management system as well as the VCU, so the vehicle control unit. This system works very well with our setup and we know that AEM works closely together with Cascadia Motion and this is the company where we got the inverter, the onboard charger and the e-motor from so we can really be sure that everything works together. So this was the first video about our battery system and there is more to come. If you have questions, please leave them down in the comment section and I will answer them in some of the upcoming videos. One of the next videos will finally be about simulation. So we have some really exciting simulations going on here using MATLAB where we are calculating the electric range for different battery configurations. So you should definitely stay tuned for that. Bye!